So what we got here is a Hawaiian petrol barrel. It's red 100. And I'm gonna have a look at the barrel itself and see how the bird is doing. Last time we checked it was incubating. We check these burrows once a month um, to assess their status over the breeding season. And uh, at the end of the season, we find out whether they fledged the chick or not successfully. There it is, there's a Hawaiian petrol. Dr. Andre Rain, I'm the project manager for the Kauai Endangered Seabird Recovery Project. The, the project itself is focused on um, three endangered seabirds on Kauai. We've got the Hawaiian petrel, the New York Shearwater, and the Band Rump Storm Petrel. Um, the New York Shearwater, which is not to be confused with the uh, much more common wedge-tailed Shearwater, is really a Kauai specialty. We've got 90% of the world population here. And um, both them and the Hawaiian petrels are actually doing really badly at the moment. Um, we know this through a number of means, but our, one of our main ways is uh, radar. And with radar, we've been doing surveys at the same spots um, for over 20 years now, so since 93. Um, there were radar surveys being done on these spots in 93, and we've continued those from 2006 onwards. And um, we've seen this huge decline um, in the numbers of Newell Shearwaters and also Hawaiian petrels over that period of time. Declines across the board up to 80, 90 percent at some sites. Um, up in the mountains in their colonies, they, uh, they're predated by introduced species, introduced predators, uh, feral cats, pigs, um, barn owls, rats. And, uh, and then in their breeding colonies, they, they breed in these uh, predominantly aluhay-covered slopes. And uh, those are being altered by invasive plants like guava, uh, ginger, Australian tree fern. And then as the birds are moving to and fro, because they're seabirds, they spend all their time out at sea uh, fishing for the, the chicks that they have up in the mountains. As they pass back and forth each day in the, in, at night to go up to their colonies, they collide with power lines. Um, when the chicks are fledging, they, have, uh, they fall out. So what that means is that the chicks are, uh, they're leaving the darkness of the interior of the island and they're heading out towards the sea and they're using the moon and the stars as navigation and they get confused by the lights of the big cities and then they end up on the ground. Once they're on the ground, they, you know, they, can't, they can't take off, they get eaten by cats, run over by cars. Um, and then another area that we don't even really know, um, but we can only assume is also a problem is the sea. Um, them being seabirds and them spending their lives at sea fishing. Uh, things like um, bycatch, overfishing, climate change, marine pollution, all these things we would imagine will have a, also have an impact on these birds. Obviously Kauai has endemic birds that don't exist anywhere else in the world. So obviously there's a huge motivation locally to help these birds. Um, I would hate to be a part of a project where we actually watched a bird decline and we weren't able to help or stop it. And I think that we're doing really good work and that we will actually turn things around for the Newells. And I try and focus on how cool these birds are, how sad it would be if they all disappeared because they're amazing. They are amazing birds. And if I can catch, you know, the kids and, and you know, the adults, the interested adults too, that say, you know, these birds are long lived, you know, 30 years, 30 plus years, they are you know, spend the first three years out at sea, they don't come to land. That blows a lot of people's minds, you know, that, you know, they're just simply not coming to land at all. Um, you know, that they dive to 150 feet, they are, you know, they're pretty, in, like, amazing birds. And um, it would be super sad to not have them continue on into the future. And, I mean, they're part of the heritage here. They've been here millennia, millennia, um, evolved here. And, you know, they um, are part of Hawaiian heritage. And and a culture um, showed the fishermen where the, the, the big schools are out there when they fish because they fish on the um, smaller bait fish that the larger um, predatory fish are forcing to the surface, all that sort of thing. And they're, um, they're just amazing little birds. So to be able to do what they do, come back to their same burrow every year, um, raise their single chick and of course they're slow uh, reproducing because they have a single chick every year they don't start breeding until they're about five or six um, they have a single chick and both parents are needed to raise that chick so it's you know it's a long it's a long thing they spend several months incubating the egg and raising the chick every year you know, I think a lot of people are aware of the issues. Um, and we have been working really closely with KUC, the utility company, to try to address some of these issues. Um, there, there is still some, uh, some misunderstandings, I would say. Some people still assume that we're talking about the wedge-tailed shearwater, which is the really common seabird that everyone sees around the coast. This is an entirely different species up in the mountains. But uh, I, I feel that the more that we talk about it, and the more we guess, get the message out, the more people do understand that, you know, this is a, these are two seabirds that are in serious decline. 
Uh, they breed up in our watersheds, so protecting the watersheds actually has huge benefits for all of us, not just the birds. I mean, you have to protect large areas for the birds, and that has knock-on benefits for plants, uh, forest birds, our, our water supply. Um, so I think, I think people are coming to understand that, you know, the reasons why it's, uh, it's so important to protect these birds and the fact that they are Kauai's bird, you know, it's Kauai, basically Kauai's seabird and that's pretty special. Bird species such as Hawaiian petrel and Newell shearwaters are, uh, are listed under the Endangered Species Act. They have dangerously low populations and are in steep decline. And the reasons for that are many, but the, the main culprits are uh, on non-native mammalian predators. So we're talking about uh, feral cats, three species of rats which have been uh, introduced to Hawaii. Um, in Kauai, we have the potential for the introduction of mongoose. They, there have been sightings here, but we don't really know if they're, they're established yet. Um, but these threats uh, exist on, the, on all the other islands as well. Um, also, uh, uh, another mammal that preys on, on these seabirds as well are pigs. And we don't usually think of pigs doing that, but uh, pigs do route up the, the burrows of Hawaiian petrels and Newell shearwaters and consume the eggs and chicks, whatever they find inside, even the adults. He's in there. See him in the Oh in the yeah. If the eggs destroyed, they don't relay. Um, they're, they're a classic example of a species which would take a long time to recover, but you remove the threats and they will recover because they, they have a long life period expectancy, for example. So over the course of their lives, they can produce many more chicks. And so um, while recovery would be slow to begin with, you definitely see this rapid increase over time. Uh, but removing all of the threats is a real challenge. <laughs> And unfortunately, I think we're in this situation now where we have to accept that some of these colonies, they will never, they will never recover. And we have to perhaps concentrate our efforts on some of the, the last strongholds of the birds. It's a really incredible opportunity to work so closely with these endangered species that a lot of people would otherwise never see. Um, to be able to handle them and interact with them daily, even though they're wild animals and you know we don't make a personal connection with them as the individual, we love the species, we love the work that we do here and it's really rewarding to finally get work a bird through the process here and release it and have high hopes of it doing well in the wild. Every morning that means every patient that's here we have to do a little physical exam on them, either check on the injury and how it's healing, check on the waterproofing by throwing them in the pool and make them work on that, or give them the proper nutrition so that they can gain mass. Um, so every day I have to look at every single patient that we get, um, that we have here, and weigh them, take a temperature, do some blood work every couple of days, and then if they're stable enough, we always put them in the pool because every single bird has to leave here completely waterproof. That's a big priority for us. The history of SOS is um, that in, back in the late 70s, uh, DNR Ardofa set up um, a, basically the aid stations and for allowance of the citizens, the residents and visitors of Kauai to pick up birds that they found downed and take them to the aid stations where staff at that time would go around to the aid stations, pick them up, um, ban them and put them into release boxes uh, where they'd fledge out to sea. And at that time there was a lot of birds getting downed um, in the thousands per season. Um, fast forward a number of years to 2004, KIUC took over the funding of the program and then in 2008 it was contracted here to the Humane Society to run so then there's a base of operations so we were able to set up, um, you know, caging of uh, uh, conditioning pools, all those kinds of things that are required for rehabilitation, for um, high standard rehabilitation, rehabilitative care. So um, that's kind of the very short version, but it ha is a very long running program, one of the longest in the world of its type. Uh, so over, it's like 36 years now or so, so uh, quite amazing. Some of these birds come down in, in dirty areas, and I'm not talking about red dirt, that's, that's easy to deal with. Um, I'm talking about um, road dirt, which has oils in it. Uh, they, they are found sometimes in people's garages, and of course garages have um, oil slicks, uh, 
spots on the surface. Uh, just those kinds of things, um, we check for that because anything of an oil base, they can't remove themselves and that renders them um, not waterproof. So we want to be very, uh, we take care and look at that sort of thing, um, make certain they have no contaminants on their feathers because any contaminants will allow for water to leak through their protective outer feathers into their down and the down is what keeps them warm. Um, so basically what happens when they go out to sea is that they get wet um, and the water gets to their skin, they get wet, they get cold, um, they stop wanting to dive, these guys dive for their food. So Birds in Hawaiian culture are significant for the fact that they can fly in the heavens and we cannot. They reach the heights that we cannot, we can only dream of. It's our most important outreach event of the year. Um, I think it's very important to get the uh, kids involved with um, the endemic, endangered animals, and it's a great opportunity for them to see these elusive animals up close. Um, you know, these are nocturnal birds that are nesting up in the mountains. Most people never see them, and to be able to see them up close and to see these downed, rehabilitated birds flying out to the ocean for the first time is very special. In regards to our care of the birds, we do everything um, possible to ensure that um, any interior light um, does not illuminate from our guest rooms or any of our public areas. A habitat conservation plan is a way for uh, businesses who are doing perfectly legal things but in the process of that end up having uh, some harm to endangered species for them to get a permit and actually con uh, contribute to the conservation of seabirds through that. So it's a way to what we call mitigate for uh, endangered species, the harm to endangered species. Everyone loves it because it's the right thing to do. Um, when we started our program, our guests are, still our guests are very involved in making sure that they follow our protocol um, and our staff have always been a part of the program um, as well. Um, many of us are born and raised here on Kauai. Um, we understand um, the, the care of our um, native environment, both the ocean and the aina. So for us, it's just an uh, important thing to do. During the non-seabird season, we have lights on these palm trees. And of course, this is sort of one of your classic features at the hotel. And it's, it's nicely uplit and you have this, this beautiful fountain. And during the seabird season, we turn all of those lights off um, just to cut down the amount of ambient light that could confuse the birds. I mean, we chose to highlight the St. Regis in this video because it's, uh, they've really done a lot of, amazing, of good work and set a really good example for how you can, during a seabird season, you can dim your lights, you can promote education, and also just to make it so that it, you turn it around and it becomes a positive because guests feel like they're, the, they're contributing towards the recovery and protection of an endangered native species. And that's a neat thing, I think, for people coming here. What's unique about this water, this vai, is that it came from the place where the birds are coming from. Now, Mike, you have to remind me, what is the name of that place? Tahia site of the Hono Onapali Natural Areas Reserve System. If these birds live in the mountains, how are they going to live down here, Mike? Oh, how are they going to live down here? Yeah. Building burrows that Robbie and folks are going to help. They're going to feed yes. them. And then at the critically right time when they're ready to fledge, they're going to be let out. They're going to imprint on the stars. And then they're going to go to the ocean and they're going to be out to sea for a number of years. Uh, three to five years and then they will come back as adults and they will nest and they will help start this new colony. Mano kalani po aloha e aloha mai kako mahalo mai kubu sebra thank you naya and kai and titus and anuhea yeah. thank you very much for coming today and thank you all for joining us in this blessing to uh, to bless the safe 
translocation of Oua'u and fledge, say fledging of Oua'u to the Nihoku Restoration Area at Kilauea Point National Wildlife Refuge. I'd like to say that uh, if it weren't for the strong and visionary leadership of the American Bird Conservancy, Pacific Rim Conservation, the Kauai Endangered Seabird Recovery Project, the Fish and Wildlife I Service, mean, and others including here. the uh, National Areas Reserve and State Division of Forestry and Wildlife, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the National Tropical Botanical Gardens, Save Our Shearwaters, and Kauai Island Utilities Cooperative, many of whom have helped fund aspects of this project. And we thank them for, for this strong contribution. We're all here because we care about these culturally and ecologically important birds, the Ua'u and the A'o, the Newell Shearwater, because they need our help. They critically need our help. This is a start of a new solution here on Kauai and hopefully an era of hope for the recovery of these bird species. Utilizing the new predator-proof fence area of nearly eight acres next to the sea, located just to the east of us here, an area that's free of all mammalian predators and situated in an accessible location where we can better protect and manage them. The nesting adults and chicks will have a much better chance of survival, um, I, I think I just wanted, not being subjected to the teeth time. of feral Thank cats you. and rats and the gauntlet of disorienting oh. lights and deadly power lines. 227. So, bird in box is 13, whoa, Nelly, 45. Oh, now we have a good looking bird. Now that's a cute factor right there. It's not fair to pick on the little ones. 111. That's a cute one. They're declining at an alarming rate due to human created challenges such as habitat degradation from introduced pigs and goats, power lines across their fledging paths, lights not appropriately shielded, irresponsible cat ownership, imported rats, barn owls, and possibly now mongoose. It is so important because it is uh, so rare, it is endangered. If they go extinct, um, they're, they're because they're one of the birds that help the islands, and if they go extinct, um, we're gonna, they're not going to be able to help the island because there is no more. The reason why the birds are hitting the wires is because they can't see the wires in the darkness. So we're trying to increase visibility of an obstruction in front of them. So the concept is that you shoot lasers between two poles and this creates a visible fence that the birds can actually see. We're hoping at least 30, 40 meters before they get to the wires and they'll fly up and over them. And so we're not trying to illuminate the wires themselves at all. We're just building a fence that they can see in the distance in front of them and they'll be able to fly up and over that. And uh, preliminary studies, we've, we've done a lot of observations with the lasers and what we've seen is that the birds will react and fly up and over them. They'll do that when we've had them on the wires themselves and we also tried lasers with no actual obstruction in the background and this also made the birds fly up and over. So we're hopeful that this will work. Right now we're doing an experiment where we have the lasers on one night and off another and we are recording or listening for the sounds of collisions. So we'll compare dark nights versus laser nights to see if the lasers are in fact working and how well they are working. And I can switch that to a different... Um, in the future, one of the things we also would like to add is so um, kind of like the idea of a coordinator unit. With this uh, computer and radio, we can uh, talk to each individual control unit and um, uh, tell lasers to turn on and off or um, change the interval, like what, what nights they turn on and which nights they, they stay off. And because um, Kauai Coffee has been so helpful and cooperative with us, we use this as one of our main experimental sites, main monitoring sites to understand bird movement and also test all these new 
uh, diversion tools. Uh, they're developed by a company for diurnal birds, and so it helps the birds see the wires earlier and they can avoid colliding with the wires. And we were just thought we would try it for nocturnal movements of birds as well. I mean, the, the idea is that they would reflect moonlight potentially, and they do absorb sunlight and glow a little bit for a while, so then they could also increase visibility through that. And then the birds would be able to see them earlier and avoid the wires altogether. So that's the goal. What One of the interesting conundrums here is that the more birds that actually hit, the quicker we can solve these problems. So that's why we're actually looking for these really bad spots to do the experiments. Because if there's only 10 birds that hit in a season, it might take us three, four years to actually get enough data to say that something's working or not. Um, and so also there's variation between years, so if you have a really low collision year for whatever reason, uh, we might think that we're going to solve, uh, get an answer in a year, but we might have to wait another year because there wasn't actually enough collisions to see um, compared dark, dark nights versus laser nights, for example. And um, next year we're going to move this whole experiment up to the Powerline Trail, and that's the highest collision spot in the entire island. So if we have the lasers going all year up there, we will definitely find out, and they're working, we'll definitely find out if the, if the lasers are good at making the birds actually miss the wires. Nineteen forty-five, one bird crossing the seven transect, flight direction of one seventy-five, minimum distance of thirteen, thirty miles an hour, straight line. It feels good to know that you're working for something to really help this species come back and this species that is endemic to Hawaii, so you can't find these birds anywhere else in the world and that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty pretty interesting environment to work in. You know, the terrain is really um really hard to work in. You're talking, you know, really steep cliffs and densely vegetated hills and then the weather is always pretty inclement. There's a lot of rain and fog and it can get pretty cold up here. So it's it's very challenging, that's for sure. It's not an easy not an easy species. Neither of them are easy species to study. So we'll shut the burrow and then we've also got a good nature rat trap nearby. And the rat traps are automatic rat traps that we use to control rats around the, the area of the burrow because the birds are very susceptible to rats, particularly during the breeding season they the rats will go in the burrow and eat the chick or the eggs. There's one very large black rat, this one. This is a real seabird cutter, this one. So it's a good thing that one's no longer part of the ecosystem. And then this here is our iPad that we used to collect all our data on. So we'll start by checking the burrow first. This is a pretty unique burrow. It's a, it was a collapsed burrow when we found it, and the bird was actually nesting basically in a hole in the open. Uh, no chick confirmed, you couldn't see the chick, couldn't see an egg. A probe response, if it's a really deep burrow, you poke in the back and the bird will peck at the, the sticks, you know it's in there. Type of burrow that the Hawaiian petrels like. They dig themselves into the side of the hillside or use, use existing caves. So that's a Hawaiian petrel. In this area we've got around 70 burrows that we monitor, um, but uh, that's just a fraction of the number of birds are actually breeding here. and uh, So the Populations probably in the hundreds on this site. That's Hawaiian petrels. Okay. It's a constant battle with the <clears throat> weather and the rain here. The microphones get soaked, the equipment gets ruined because it's always raining. Well, these are these are saw meters, they're acoustic recording devices. This is actually the guts of the, the unit. And you see the two microphones here. And so basically what this is doing is we've got it set to record um, two hours after dark and two hours before dawn for uh, in, at intervals during those periods and that's the time period when the birds are most vocally active and um, we used to be then send this information off to a company in California called the data goes off to a company in California called conservation metrics and they analyze the data for us and they basically run it through a computer program to look for calls and then so we get the information back on call rates and uh, with that call rates for the two species the Hawaiian petrels and the New Shore order um, we can then compare interannually in between sites to see how the management's going. Um, you know, if the call rates are decreasing, something's going wrong at the site. If they're increasing, things are looking positive and so on. Set up the camera. So these cameras have no glow at night, so you don't illuminate the bird. Which is a, obviously, you don't want to illuminate a nocturnal seabird as it comes back to its nest. It's a tricky burrow, this, because you can see there's actually two holes. But probably he's coming out of that one mainly, so. 
I, I would say the outlook's not bright because the species declined so massively. You know, 75, 80% in 20 years is a huge decline. Um, but we're also at a position now where we can understand, you know, why these species are declining. And now that we're in a position where we understand what the threats are, we can actually work towards uh, dealing with them. So, um, you know, up in the mountains, controlling the invasive predators and the plants, um, working with the utility company to figure out ways to prevent power line collision, uh, working with um, people all on the coastal areas to deal with their um, sources of light attraction. So, you know, the, while, the, while the trends are really bleak, I also feel that the future is um, it, quite positive because we are in a position where we can actually do something about it to reverse these declines. Uh, you know, all the different challenges they're facing all the, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, in the sea, on the land, um, throughout the whole of the breeding season, which is such a long period of time, so they're exposed to these threats for a significant period of time when they're on the land. Um, you know, removing one threat is not going to save the species. You have to remove a whole suite of threats um, if you want to recover them. Oh, somebody's been fed lately. And including these students is just to expose them to the beauties of Kauai, the beautiful places of Kauai. We live here and we've never been to this particular spot before. And uh, you never know what you're going to wake up inside of these little people. Just weighing them to make sure that they're good enough condition. 